fabulous children who, I see my daughter, I don't see my son, I hope he's here, or if he had to go back with his daughters, um, which I'm really fortunate. And they each have two children, and at this early stage of the game, they seem wonderful. So we're all very fortunate, except for the one that's crying. Um, but, it, but it's good. It, it's really damn good. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Then I keep going down this meandering path in my life where I got fired. I got fired from that firm. And it turns out it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. And I'll circle back to that too in a minute. But it has to do with this guy in the red shirt. Um, <coughs> then there was, there was a period of time where I was going out with this woman who got me really, really angry one time. So everyone would have walked out the door of this hotel room to go for a run down the beach. I decided to jump over the wading pool, and it turns out the shrubs on the other side caught me. And, and I, I broke my hand, and lo and behold, I met my wonderful wife as a result. Um, so, you know, life, life has its, its funny things. I have another dear friend who's here today, and, and we were involved in the startup of a business 30 odd years ago, 40 years ago. And um, which some guys told us recently, they're writing a book, that we were ahead of our time. And I said, that's a euphemism for we failed. Um, uh, and so we were writing to each other the other night. And I said, geez, if those guys and the subscribers, you know, our customers would have liked us, loved us as much as these guys, we would have been in good shape. And he wrote me back how life would have been different. And I wrote him back, yeah, but I think this life was better. Um, so, you know, I don't believe in all this planning. I believe in serendipity and great, great goddamn luck and knowing the right people. A um, couple of other things. Not only are my children here, but, but, but I have others here. I don't like the phrase in-law, like son-in-law, daughter-in-law. You know what that means to me? That means you're introducing somebody to them. And in case they don't like them, you're putting some distance between you and them. Um, uh, I'm very lucky. I love my son-in-law. I love my daughter-in-law. They're, they're another son. They're another daughter. Uh, my brother-in-law, he's my brother. I, I don't know who's still here or who's home with their children already, but, but I'm very, very fortunate that way. Uh, they're all here today. It's not easy for them to drag down from New York. Of course, it was going to snow up there, so that was an incentive. <laughs> but, but, but it ain't easy. And, and I'm really lucky. And, you know, my children have found these wonderful spouses, and they in turn have had children of their own. And, and I hope they're as lucky as I am, as I was, and as I am. Um, I have to say that uh, a couple of other things. One thing sounds a little sad, but I don't mean it to be. When I was 14 years old and I was in high school, I met this woman who, who um, I wish she was here tonight. 10, 11 years after I met her, we got married. And we were married 30 years. And um, you know, we did not live happily ever after, after. We changed. And we went our separate ways, but peacefully. And unfortunately, she passed away this last summer unbelievably prematurely from a terrible disease. And um, had she been alive, she would have been here tonight because that was the kind of person she was. And I wish she were here because she would have made it a better place. Uh, I had a second marriage, which I wouldn't say the same thing about. <laughs> I have a very good friend who couldn't make it tonight because his wife got sick. But had he been here, I would have celebrated him a little. Because in that marriage, his wife was my ex-wife's first cousin, and I got them in the divorce. Um, and he's a great, great friend. Those of you have heard me talk about him, Grandpa Mike. And unfortunately, he's not here this evening. I, his wife just got sick and they couldn't come. Um, you know, I never talk from notes, and now I'm feeling bad that I'm not talking from notes. Um, it, it's hard to single out certain people, because you always run the risk of who did I leave out, and who did I screw up, but I don't give a shit. Um, so, so there's a handful of people that I, I really want to single out, 
over the course of time that have been important to me in one way or another. Um, and this is in no potential, no, no, no particular rather sequence. It's just as it's occurring to me now after a bunch of Tito's. Um, who that was Frank? Frank? Frank, <laughs> Frank, stand up. Stand up, Frank. You are standing. by the ear and led me around and introduced me to people. I feel about him like a brother, about to whom was, who was very special to me. And I, I thank him and I thank him forever. And I really do. And me too. And from, from Tom, I met Larry. Where the hell are you, Larry, with that dirty t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> And it's fun to, you know, think about those old days. We've been to the same places, we've done the same things, you know, we've dealt in the same marketplaces. But much more important, we share the same values. And, and I love sitting around with Larry and kicking around our mutual values, which to me is so symmetric. And when I'm not sure about something and I chat with him, I become more sure. And, and I really, really value my friendship with Larry. Very much. Before I was here, I have a good friend. Jimmy, where are you? James? There he is. My friend Jimmy flew in from Phoenix today with his, with his friend Shelly. So, so you can join us. Everybody, many people here know I know Louis since 72, and I'll talk about Louis in a minute. But I know Jimmy since 79. You know, it ain't that much more, that much shorter, right? What week before just, just, just when Leslie was being born is right. My 39-year-old daughter of two. I met Jimmy before I met Leslie. <laughs> uh, Jimmy and I did a lot of stuff together, and the stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, there's actually some guys that have called us up the last few weeks who were writing a book, and in the course of them researching this book. They think there's stuff that he and I did that was fairly innovative. This is in 1980. And, and they're interviewing us all of a sudden saying we want to write about you guys and what you did, which is pretty cool. But, but the parts they don't know is when Jimmy and I were flying around America and we were going to three test markets a day around New York, uh, America and Canada and you couldn't get to any of them direct. It was impossible. Um, they don't know about the time I, 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 I like the racetrack. Winner! They're posting! Four horse, 20 to win. Um, they don't know about the time when I met Jimmy at the Santa Clara Marriott, kind of late at night in San Francisco, and as I walked in, he was standing on the reservation desk. Standing on it, not by it. And then, and then there was the day when we were, I think it was Caesar's Palace, 
and we were scored out, scored out early because he jumped on the stage to kiss, um, what the hell was her name, the original Wonder Woman, um, Linda Carter. Linda Carter. And, and so we had to leave a little earlier than planned. Um, but my friend Jimmy is brilliant, and I've learned a great deal from Jimmy. And, and very proud that he came out here for this weekend. Um, my friend Lewis, I owe everything to of, 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 of an economic nature, that's for sure. And much more than that as well. Um, we've been buddies, co-workers, partners, whatever other category there is, since 1972. I have an ego that would fill this room without trying. He has an ego that would fill it twice as much. <laughs> All these years, we've never had an argument. And I, I dare anybody who's been in a marriage or anything since 1972 or equivalent length to tell me they've never had an argument. Yeah. Never an argument. And if it was a part of Lewis, I shut my big fucking mouth. And if it was a part of me, he shut his big beautiful mouth. <laughs> and I have an awful lot to thank Lewis for, and I think he knows that. period between marriage one and marriage three, and that's not easy to say. Because um, I view the failure of marriage one as the great failure of my life. Just because I think it would be wonderful to say I was married 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. That would have been better. It just didn't happen. Um, but there was a period where, where I was a little disconsolate, and there was a bar near where I lived up in Jersey, and you could smoke cigars, and live little most of my life. And I'd sit there sometimes by myself, and I would think about things, you know. And, and I decided, let me see if I can get it right tonight. There were seven things in life that matter. Seven things. You gotta be healthy, you gotta get along well and ha see that your children are happy and healthy. You have to have good friends. You have to have a vo vocation that you enjoy. You have to have a vocation that you enjoy going to work, so it's not like being a soldier. You have to have an avocation, a hobby, or something like that that occupies you, that you enjoy, that gives you pleasure. If you're lucky, you're not living check to check, but you have a little bit of freedom. It doesn't have to be rich. A little bit of freedom. And the seventh one was to have someone to share it all with. Some people might add religion in there. I don't. But I can understand with some might. But I don't. So there were those seven things. And I'd sit at the bar at night a little pissed off at the way my life was going. And then I said to myself, you know what, you have six of the seven. What the hell are you complaining about? And I would have those debates with myself. And I said, you know, how many people have six out of seven? Straighten up and stop the bullshit and stop feeling sorry for yourself. Go about your life. And then I got lucky. I made that jump that day. I broke my hand with that one. And I met Kelly. Where the hell are you, Kelly? <laughs>
I can remember the time when they rang my front door for my 75th birthday. And I opened the door, it's a place called Long Island, and there were 75 bottles of wine. <laughs> they could have wine. <laughs> so I, I was trying to think, how do I epitomize a guy I love? And it occurred to me that his outstanding attribute was generosity. And I just want you to know that. He shares everything in his life that's good. His wealth, his, what his gifts to charity that he doesn't talk about very much, the friendship that has endured here. He got a very lucky with Kelly. You know, sometimes you just get lucky. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and just recently, he and I looked at uh, pictures from my 80th birthday. Gary gave a speech about myself and my first wife who died after 53 years. And I was thinking, how do I epitomize this relationship with a guy I love, which is not what masculine guys talk about. And I just want to say, to me it's a couple sentences. He's the most generous guy I've ever met in my life. He gives of his heart. He gives of his wallet. He gives of his spirit. Most importantly, he gives us time. So God bless us. Amen.